All right, we're gonna talk about the different materials that we might see in the cabinet making class and in the architecture and construction career cluster. And so some of these materials you'll need to be familiar with and be able to look at them and identify them easily. Some of them we won't use quite as much, but you should still be familiar with them. The first ones we're gonna talk about are the different types of materials. So we typically have two different types. The first being our sheet goods, and these are, are usually man-made materials. They could be material from a tree like these, now, sheet goods typically come in a sheet that's 48 by 96, and they are going to be made out of materials such as natural wood, but they're gonna be engineered a little different. So they're gonna have either layers or different textures to them that make them more than just a piece of wood. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we get into that. The other type we're gonna talk about is our solid lumber. And our solid lumber is typically cut from trees and the tree is cut into then logs, what is cut into planks and cut into different styles of material depending on what it's used for. So as we take a look at these two, we're gonna talk about some of our sheet goods first. This one here is one that we're not going to use a lot in cabinet making class, but you should definitely be familiar with it as it is part of the architecture and construction industry, it's used a lot. And this, if you don't know the name, this is called OSB or oriented strand board. These wafers or strands of material are oriented in here in a pattern that gives this sheet some strength. So typically just like any piece of wood, the OSB sheet is strong one direction and weaker the other direction based on the orientation of these strands or wafers that are in here. Where we typically see this is for sheeting for houses. So typically after they build a house, they frame it up, then they would sheet it with material to kind of lock it into place so it doesn't move and shift around with wind and things like that. Now OSB is a little bit cheaper than using plywood so that it, uh, for the sheeting on the house, if you were to use plywood, your expense would be quite a bit higher for sheeting your, your house than it would be using OSB. So another sheet good we should be familiar with, this is also made from wood or sawdust here. And this is called particle board. So as we take a close look, we should see the little sawdust and or chips of wood in here that are compressed together using glue or some type of adhesive to make this into a sheet form. If we take a closer look, you'll see the little particles here. There's not really any direction to these particles. There's not really any grain of the wood or anything like that. So again, it's just kind of a larger uh, sawdust material that is glued together. This is a byproduct from when they're cutting down our large pieces of solid lumber or our solid lumber and the saw is taking out material, it's creating sawdust and chips, things like that. So they use this byproduct or waste material and create it into a particle board. Particle board is relatively inexpensive compared to sheet goods. One thing it's used for a lot is pattern making. So if you were gonna make a pattern out of something and then try to replicate that, you could use particle board to first shape and create that pattern. And then you could trace out or lay out the pattern onto your good material when you were done with that. Another type of sheet good you should be familiar with. Now, if we take a look at this one, this one is a little bit harder to see. There's no grain, no chips or anything like that that we really see. It's just kind of tan colored board. Now, this is a really heavy material. This also is made from a byproduct and this is called MDF. This is medium density fiber board. Now this material is finer particles of sawdust than the particle board was. And so you won't see any particles in here because this is more of that fine powdery dust from the sawdust that's compressed into a wood form with glue and adhesive. Now both of these materials, uh, particle board here and MDF here are not very good materials for building when you have to drive nails and screws into things because this, you can drive a screw into it, but there's really not any structure to it. So as a screw starts to tighten up, those threads will just kind of tear out 
because there's no strength in that sawdust. All right, one more sheet good here, or another sheet good we're gonna look at. This material here you might notice inside a cabinet. If you open up kitchen cabinets at your house or maybe a relative's house, grandma, grandpa, something like that, and it's bright white inside, and it's kind of a plasticky texture. Now we can see there are different colors. There's also some that have wood grain to them. They almost look like wood, but if you look closely at it, you can tell it's plastic. This type of material is called melamine. Melamine is a laminate type material that's attached to a substrate or a core material. So the core in this instant, if we take a look, re resembles very similarly the particle board that we looked at. So this is particle board core and it's melamine on the outside. Now you can get melamine with different core materials, but typically what you see is particle board for the core material of melamine. Melamine is really nice because it's plasticky. So if we do our cabinets in that, if we spill something inside, we can easily wipe it out or clean it out. It cleans up really well because it doesn't absorb any um, liquid or stains or anything like that. So melamine is a is we would use this quite a bit uh, in the professional cabinet industry because this white material is nice because it cleans easy. The material is fairly inexpensive with the particle board inside. Now we can use when I talked about earlier that we don't want to use MDF or particle board for building really because when you drive screws into it and nails as it starts to move around then they start to become weak. So an example of this would be if you built a nightstand out of melamine and you drag it around your living room as you rearrange your living room, the nails and screws that are kind of holding that together are going to get weak over time. Now it's suitable for cabinets. And the reason for that is, is because when cabinets are created, they're generally fastened to the wall and they don't move around like furniture. So we can use a lesser grade of core material like particle board or MDF in the center, because once those cabinets are assembled, they're gonna be installed in a residence or a building, and then they're not gonna move anymore. So that's why we can use the melamine in our cabinets. And that's why it's not really great for furniture. Now we've seen, you've probably seen some furniture that has particle board core like this, probably has some kind of wood grain for its melamine cover. Typically, if you were to go to Walmart or something like that and buy a piece of furniture where you have to assemble it, a lot of times that material is going to have a particle board core and it's going to have a melamine or some kind of laminate on the outside to make it look like wood. Melamine also has some negative characteristics. If this gets wet, it's going to suck up or absorb water really well. And then it's going to expand and it's going to not be nice and uniform in thickness. So one downside by using this in a kitchen for kitchen cabinets would be if you get it wet, maybe you spill water repeatedly by the dishwasher or by the sink, over time that can swell up this material and cause it maybe your drawers to not move smoothly, things like that because of the swollen a material that is no longer the same thickness as it was when it started. Now, the best sheet good that we're going to be using in class is this material here. It's easy to identify because if we look here, we have nice uniform layers in here. This material is called plywood. When we talk about plywood, there's lots of variations of plywood. But in here, the plywood that we're going to be using has a veneer on the outside. So it's going to have some material inside to that has different layers in here. We can easily identify that. And then the outside edge up here, this surface is going to be a veneer. Usually it's a thin layer of solid wood of some kind that's put on there to make this plywood have a good face or a desirable face. Now we'll look a little bit later when we look at some of the other types of plywood and you'll see how some of them are just left like pine and you get knots and things like that in there. But for this one here, as we're just talking about plywood generically, plywood is really strong. They say plywood is stronger than steel pound for pound. So if I had a piece of steel that was this same size, for it to weigh the same as this board, it would have to be super thin. 
And so it wouldn't be able to hold as much material. So because of that, plywood is very strong. And these layers that you can easily identify the different layers, they run different directions. So maybe this one's running lengthwise here. Then the next one, the grain would run widthwise. And then the next one would go lengthwise again and widthwise and so on. That's where it gets its strength is with those grains alternating patterns. It has a lot of strength. When it comes to plywood, uh, the core material will typically be in odd number layers. So you would typically have three, five, seven, 11, nine, those kind of things in there because we want the two outside faces to match each other. If we had an even number, as you got through the plywood, the two outside edges would be opposite of each other. So a good thing to, to notice or to remember is that plywood typically has an odd number of layers inside. Now, again, there could be more layers or less layers depending on what material you get. Typically, the more layers there are, the more suitable the wood is or the more stable it is. Less warping, things like that, that could happen on you. Now, when we talk about plywood, plywood has some very good advantages to, for us. One is that with the layers that are glued together, these would all be solid lumber, by the way. So plywood is technically all hardwood material or solid lumber material. It just has extra glue in there between the different layers. Now, one advantage is that it's super strong. The other advantage is that it's more stable. So it's going to expand less than solid lumber. Solid lumber is going to expand and contract more with the different moisture seasons. And plywood is going to be more stable in that aspect that it doesn't expand and contract as much. Plywood does come in a variety of thicknesses. So you could get it from, I've seen it as thin as eighth inch plywood, all the way up to about a one inch thick plywood. I'm sure special circumstances Manufacturers will make some that's even bigger than one inch. Just remember on the outside of plywood, especially the hardwoods, we're going to have a veneer. And the veneer is a thin layer of wood that's attached to the core material. The core of this type is plywood and the veneer gives it a nice look. So now we're looking at this material here, but if we look at the grain patterns and when we talk about grain of wood, we're talking about all of these lines that are in here. So this here would be tight grained. Over here would be wider grain. You can see how these dark lines are a lot wider apart than over here. They're a lot more narrow. So when we look at this, we need to be able to identify our different kinds of woods. Now this specifically is solid oak. And we can tell that it's solid lumber by looking at the edges. We don't see a nice uniform layer like we saw on the last slide with the plywood. We do down here kind of see some layers, but they're not nice and uniform and straight. These layers that we're seeing here, are actually the annual rings or the growth rings of the tree. So they're in more of a, a circular pattern than nice straight lines like we saw in the plywood. Oak is typically kind of a pinkish or tan hue. So as we look at the oak, one thing that oak has pretty characteristic about it are these little gray lines in here. These are called rays or ray lines. These rays are more prevalent in oak than most other species. So as we look at this, we have our grain, we have our more dense grain that's dark, our lighter grain, and then we have all of these little ray lines or rays in here that help us to better identify oak. Typically on the end grain where we have a cut that's across the grain here, on solid oak, you'll really be able to identify the pores. You'll see the pores that are in the tree uh, or in the wood, very noticeable on oak. So if we take a closer look at the end grain up close here, we can see these big open pores that you can see on the end grain of the wood. These pores over here are a little bit smaller and more closed. These pores over here are a little bit more open than um, you would definitely see on most other woods. So that's one characteristic about oak that kind of helps identify it is by looking at the end grain and seeing if you can see those large pores. So this is solid oak. You need to be familiar with it, be able to identify it based on its look and its texture there. The next one we're going to take a look at here, if we take a look, if we notice this is the same grain or same look as that last piece. 
But now if we take a look, we'll look down here, there is plywood layers. We can see nice uniform layers. We do need to be able to identify the difference between solid oak and oak plywood. Okay, and being able to identify those grains, again, some of it's more pinkish hue, some of it might be more tan, and how the grain patterns kind of look on oak. The next kind of wood we're going to be looking at here, can we tell if it's solid lumber or plywood? Well, if we take a look down here, we see kind of a radius shape in those lines. They're not nice and uniform all the way across. So this indicates to us that this is solid lumber. And this is going to be solid pine. Now, pine is a little bit more yellow in color. Sometimes we'll have a little bit tighter grain. You'll notice there's no like little gray specks like there was in the oak. It's just kind of whitish color and then darker yellow or tan color. Pine is sometimes sticky to the touch because of the amount of sap that's in the wood. Sometimes you'll grab some and it will have a, a sticky or tacky texture. Now, pine is one that we really don't like to use in the cabinet making shop because what happens is pine has a lot of sap and resin in there, and that will heat up with the friction of the machines and transfer to our saw blades and our sandpaper belts. So it gums up our machines a little bit more quickly than our other kinds of material. But again, you need to be able to identify the difference between the oak and the pine. And again, that pine is got this yellowish kind of tint to it. This one is going to be able to, you might be able to recognize it by the, the odor or the aroma that it gives off. If you were to cut a piece of this wood and smell it, it's going to smell like a Christmas tree. It's going to have that very pine uh, smell. It is pine. It's going to smell like that kind of aroma when you cut into it. Again, very distinct smell for pine. We're going to take a look here. Here's another piece. Now, if you look at this one compared to the last one, they look very similar in color and grain. And this is going to be our pine plywood. Now, typically with pine plywood, you don't get really tight grain. You get this big grain pattern in the material. Now, this one has some knots in here. So this is going to be a lesser grade than like a, a uh, clear or a select. But this, if you went out to Menards and bought or Larry's Lumber or Cashway or Home Depot, those kind of stores, this is probably the kind of grades of material you're going to get. This is probably a C face, maybe a B face with some, with some knots in there. So again, pine plywood. It's got that yellow, yellowish or orange hue to it. Now this material here, we won't use a lot in here, but a couple of characteristics we need to know about it. Now, this is called cedar. Now, these are two different kinds of cedar. This is one that we uh, might see a little bit more commonly. This is a Western red cedar, and it's going to usually have knots in there, and it's a little bit more darker tan. And this one here is going to be an aromatic cedar. And the aromatic cedar usually has this purplish or pinkish kind of hue to it that you'll notice with the white or sap wood right next to it. Cedar is grown around here. And with cedar, the problem is, is it's super soft. So it's really light because it's not very dense. You could take your fingernail and scratch the surface of the wood, but it really does have some characteristics that are desirable. Cedar has a natural resistance to rot, kind of like a treated material would have, but it's natural in there. So it's not going to weather and age as much as it would as a regular piece of wood wood sitting out in the outdoor environment. Plus, if it's exposed to uh, moisture, like this was on a fence and this edge was sitting on the ground, it's not going to rot and decay as fast as our other materials. Now, aromatic cedar, when you were, if you were to have this in the shop and you were to make a cut on it, you would very uh, easily walk into the shop and be able to smell that. It has a, a very strong smell. The aromatic cedar works well for doing things like cedar chests and projects like that. If you have anybody at home, a grandma, a mother, something like that, that has a cedar chest, the reason people have cedar chests are to keep their valuable type things. Usually people put wedding dresses or other momentums in there. And the reason that they do this is because cedar naturally repels bugs and insects. It's like having a piece of furniture that has mothballs in there because 
the cedar naturally repels those insects and rodents to stay away from your valuables. Now, cedar is very soft, and so you wouldn't typically build your entire cedar chest out of, out of the cedar. Typically, you make your chest out of something more suitable wood, and then you would line the inside with cedar to get that smell. You can also even buy chunks of cedar on coat hangers that could hang in your closet so that you could have that uh, smell or aroma in your closet. So one other characteristic about cedar is that you can very easily smell it and identify it by its smell. Now, again, the aromatic cedar is more potent than the Western red cedar. The red cedar is going to be less smelly or less aroma than the aromatic cedar. But you can identify the wood species if you're unsure by smelling it and seeing what kind of smell it has to it. This piece of material here, if we look at it, it might look like one that we've already looked at or similar. This is a piece of treated pine. Now treated material may look different depending on what kind you're looking at. This is kind of a green treat. They also make treated material that's brown. And the treated material is used with chemicals to preserve it, to give it a lasting, uh, a longer lasting surface. So if this material is in contact with the ground, whether it's a deck or a fence or even, um, you know, a fence post, those kind of things are in contact with the ground. They're moist a lot. And so the pressure treated or the treated material helps it from rotting or decaying. So it kind of gives it that cedar effect without actually being cedar. Typically, when you grab a piece of wood that's treated, it is usually heavier or more dense than a piece that would not be treated. Usually there's more moisture content in that material. We really wanna avoid using treated lumber inside the shop here. We don't have open ventilation like you would outside. So if we're turning pieces like this on the lathe or cutting a lot of it, we're gonna get a lot of dust in the air that has extra chemicals in there that we don't necessarily want to breathe. So really we don't bring treated materials into the shop. There might be a special rare occasion that we would, but for the most part, generally speaking, we do not use treated material in the shop. So different classifications of wood. There's two different types or classifications of wood when we talk about that. There's hardwoods and softwoods. Now, what is the difference in the two? If you're driving down the highway and you're seeing trees all over, how do you tell if they're hardwoods or if they're softwoods? Now, this does not have anything to do with their density. A hardwood does not mean it's more hard than a softwood. Softwoods, there are some species of softwoods that are more dense than hardwoods and vice versa, hardwoods that are less dense than some of the softwoods. So when we talk about hardwoods and softwoods, we're kind of getting back to that sciency type uh, information that we learned maybe in science class about conifer or coniferous and deciduous trees. So deciduous would be a hardwood tree and hardwood trees typically look like this. They're going to have leaves that fall off in the fall or winter time. Softwoods are characterized by staying typically green year round. They're not going to lose their leaves or needles. And so as we look in, a softwood tree here is going to have uh, needles, maybe kind of a web needle or pine needles, kind of like this, that would stay on the tree and they don't fall off. That's a softwood or a conifer or coniferous tree. Now the hardwoods, they're going to have our leaves. They're going to be trees that lose their leaves. They look bare in the winter. Their leaves are going to fall on the ground. Maybe they change color. And so that's how we're going to distinguish the two apart. If you're driving down the road and you see a tree that has leaves, then that's going to be a hardwood tree. If you're driving down the road and you see a tree that looks like pine or sorry, has needles that don't fall off, kind of like a Christmas tree, that's going to be your softwood trees. All right, that's all we have for you in the presentation here. If you have any questions, please talk to your instructor and get those questions answered.